right along to MV Ramana, um, who received his PhD in physics from Boston University and is currently with the Nuclear Futures Laboratory and, and the Program on Science and Global Security at the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton University. Um, he has worked on a range of issues related to nuclear weapons and nuclear energy. Ramana is the author of The Power of Promise, Examining Nuclear Energy in India, and co-editor of Prisoners of the Nuclear Dream. He is a member of the International Panel on Fissile, Missile, uh, Fissile Materials, uh, the Science and Security Board of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, and National Coordinating Committee of India's Coalition for Nuclear Disarmament and Peace, and on the Global Council of Abolition 2000. He is the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship and a Leo Seiler Award of the uh, American Physical Society. So welcome, Mr. Ramana. Thank you. And um, it's also a little, um, what should you say, uh, unnerving to have uh, half of your talk being stolen by Jackie. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> she she up, oh, lots of stuff which I wanted to say about nuclear power, but that's okay. You know, you know all this stuff, so there's no need to sort of reinforce all that. Um, and it's probably good that it's out of the way. Um, I want to start by sort of coming back to why many of us are in New York this weekend. Uh, which is the grave danger of climate change that we all sort of recognize. Um, it's, you know, rightly described as an emergency by some people. We have to do things really fast if we have to have any chance at all of averting disastrous climate change. And so we are told many, quite often that all options should be on the table. And this is a <laughs> statement which comes up very, very often. Um, and because nuclear power is a low carbon source of electricity, and I don't dispute that at all, uh, we can talk about that later if you want, um, it's, we are told that nuclear power should be on the table. And that's certainly true, I agree. The problem is that nuclear power is already well on the table, right? You have dozens of governments supporting nuclear power, building nuclear power plants. You have um, number of um, uh, 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 construction companies, nuclear construction companies who go around trying to sell nuclear power plants to every country in the world. There's an army of lobbyists who use every possible technique out on the, out on the propaganda uh, book to try and convince us that nuclear power is a good thing, right? And that we should be doing something. Uh, and yet, nuclear power is actually, um, in terms of uh, how much it contributes to the world's electricity, it's actually declining, right? The historically high figure was in the early 90s. It was around 17% of the global electricity. Today it's about 10 to 11%, right? And it's coming down every year. And if in, in any kind of business as usual scenario, by like 2030, it's probably going to be down to a few percent, 6%, 7% at most, something of that sort. Um, so it's not something which is, unless something miraculous happens, is not going to really help us. Uh, with this problem of climate change. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about what the nature of the problem is. But uh, b uh, let me just say here that you know some of the issues which I think confront us uh, in terms of thinking about nuclear power as a solution uh, are that the countries that are uh, increasing their emissions rapidly, so-called developing countries, are all places where there is not much nuclear power. Um, I happen to have studied one of them for a very long time, which is India. Uh, India has had a nuclear power program for 60 years. Right? And every government has supported it with all its heart. And yet, nuclear power constitutes something like 2 to 4% of the country's electricity. Every time there's a new reactor, it'll go up to about 4%, then it'll come back down to about 2% as other things get built up. And this has been the state for the last 20 years. Right? And if I had bet, you know, in several years, I mean, several decades from now, it will still be the same kind of range. Why is that the case? Uh, this is the case partly because of um, uh, the fact that nuclear power is an extremely complex technology. It is not easy to build nuclear reactors. They take a long time to build. They cost a lot. And lots of things can go wrong. And the only way that the um, nuclear enterprise, as uh, Jackie sort of put it uh, earlier, tries to sell you this dream is to say, you know, all the problems we had with nuclear power, don't think about it. Right? <laughs> From now on, it's going to be perfect. All the problems you've done, and you've sort of exhausted the set of problems that are there. 
and from now on it's going to be all rosy, right? So in a way, nuclear power has been the sort of archetypal future tense technology, right? You don't look at the past. If you look at the history, you're going to be real, you know, uh, unhappy about it, right? So that's really the sort of uh, way by which it's going to go forward, right? So, you know, that's, I think, the uh, reality of what's going to be happening. Um, the uh, one other thing, one other thing that the industry always sort of talks about is that well, you know, these are problems which happened because these were old reactors, right? And think about Fukushima. They say, oh, that was a Generation Two reactor, you know, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I've been studying this for you know two decades. I still don't understand what one of these generations mean. But anyway, mm -hmm. um, but of course, in terms of new technologies, new nuclear reactor design, all these problems are not going to be there, right? And all the problems that Jackie mentioned, the fact that they are prone to catastrophic accidents, the problem that they are expensive, the problem that they produce radioactive waste that stays hazardous to human health for hundreds of thousands of years, and the problem that they are related to nuclear weapons. These are four problems, you know, safety, uh, cost, uh, waste, and uh, proliferation are things which even the nuclear industry will admit. But what they usually will say is that, oh, we have now a new generation of reactors. Right? And these are going to magically solve. True. If you look at any of those designs, um, these different priorities, shall we say, increasing safety, uh, making it cheaper, reducing the amount of waste produced, uh, trying to uh, reduce the link with proliferation, they all pull in different directions. You cannot make one reactor design that does all of this simultaneously. You want to make something cheaper, you're probably going to make it less safe. You want to make something produce less waste, you're probably going to make it more proliferation, uh, pro uh, proliferation risky. Right? So that is a fundamental problem with this thing. There is no one magical solution that's going to come. Okay. So this, I think, is the, is the main sort of um, uh, problem with nuclear power. But I also want to now get to a different point, which is, um, and I don't want to sort of, this is, as I said, a, a well-known point. We don't want to sort of beat around that which is to come back to the question of um, climate change itself, right? And ask the question, what kind of a problem is climate change? In what sense can this be a solution, right? And if you ask uh, people, what is, the, what is the problem of climate change? In this country especially, the, the answer you typically get is, our carbon dioxide emissions are rising and rising, and the Earth's capacity does not hold, and so we have to reduce that emissions. And you can do that by some combination of technologies, and maybe some set of economic tricks, you know, cap and trade or whatever it is. And that is the problem. And that's how you have to approach the solution. You go to the rest of the world, especially in the so-called developing countries, and you ask them the same question. What's, what's the problem of climate change? And they'll give you a very different answer. They'll say, the Earth's atmosphere has only a limited capacity for dealing with greenhouse gases and carbon dioxide emissions. Right? And this space will have to be equitably shared. Right now, there are a bunch of countries which have emitted a huge amount in the past, and as a consequence, they've become very rich. And now that we are sort of becoming a little bit richer, they're all getting concerned about it and telling us we don't get our fair share of this. Right? So it becomes a question of sharing. right? And this is the problem that has been confounding, in a sense, all the climate negotiations that are going on under the UNFCCC. Um, so every year, every, every year, the Conference of the parties for the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change meet in various parts of the world, and they try to say, okay, let's come to some kind of agreement. You know, this was what the Kyoto Protocol was about a decade and a half ago, and the thing that confounds them is basically the problem of sharing. And why is that sort of be being such a big problem? It's been a problem partly because um, those countries, which have already sort of cornered a large portion of the Earth's atmosphere, have sort of um, squatted on those uh, uh, emission rights, as it were, um, are unwilling in any way to try and change their ways of life. Right? And the first President Bush said this quite well uh, when he went to the Rio conference. He said, the American way of life is not up for negotiation. Right? <laughs> but lest you think that this is a problem only with Republicans, Barack Obama said almost exactly the same thing um, at his inauguration meeting. He said, we are not, I forget the exact quote, uh, but uh, you can go and look it up, it's not very difficult. It's, he says something along the lines of, we will never waver in our defense of our way of life, right? And so you want to ask the question, what is this way of life, right? That they're sort of so unwavering in their defense. And, um, you know, you know, in one word, if you want to put it, 
it's consumerism of some kind, right? And this is sort of fundamental to the economic structure that we have. The economic structure that we have is based fundamentally on ever increasing economic growth, right? The moment you find these GDP growth figures sort of fall below some, you know, magical number around three percent or something, people get very uncomfortable, right? They say, "Oh my God, something is wrong. We need to do something to boost the economy, lower the interest rate, do something to do that." Right? And in this, given that we are in New York, I remind you of what happened on Sept after September 11th, right? The, the uh, horrible strikes on the twin towers, and of course, people were shocked. And for a few days, you know, everybody was in shock, people talking to each other, you know, sitting at homes. And then everybody had to come out and say, please go and shop. We have a problem, right? And please go and fly the planes, right? These are sort of the ways which, and you know, this is not something which is inherent to people, right? It's the economy that does it to it. I mean, and uh, again, there's an enterprise of people who are, an army of people who are uh, employed to try and convince people that they need to, con they need to consume more, right? Um, the quintessential, the quintessential example is sort of Apple, right? Um, you know, and I must, when I must say that, you know, no, no offense to her, there was a lovely young woman who was sitting next to me on the train who had with her an iPhone, um, two iPads, and a Mac, <laughs> all right? And she was sort of doing something, you know, very industriously, sort of transferring stuff from one to the other, checking something on the other, and of course, like a real poster child for Apple. Uh, for the Apple company, she actually took out Apple and ate it. For a snack. <laughs> <laughs> no offense meant to her. Okay? Uh, but this is, I think, one of the major problems that we actually um, deal with, right? Uh, and you know, and likewise, a couple of days ago in the New York Times, there was a piece which talked about how um, many of these companies had gone to developing countries like China and India to try and figure out how we can sell stuff to them to their to the you know many billions of people who really have incomes which are appallingly low compared to ours. So we have to make products that they can buy within their thing and to sort of live in that particular kind of infrastructure. Again, these are all people who are engaged in trying to make sure that people consume more and more and more. And so not just is not just the West, it's also the, in these developing countries, the elite in those countries, and the rest of the people, quite naturally, are aspiring to higher and higher standards. And on a finite planet, infinite growth is not possible. Right, uh, the um, uh, Indian leader Mahatma Gandhi once put it this way. He said, "The earth has enough for every man's need, but not for every man's greed." Um, and uh, so that I think is is the sort of conundrum that we live with. And until we sort of confront that, um, we are not going to be able to deal with uh, climate change. Right, mm -hmm. and the problem with nuclear power, in a sense, is that it actually reinforces that particular paradigm. Right, and it does so in two ways. One is this sort of notion that this, this is magical technology that's going to come and fix the problem without us having to make any kind of hard choices about how we live our lives, how we organize our society, how our economy is organized, and so on. Right? Uh, my friend Bob Jensen, who teaches in the journalism school in uh, UT Austin, uh, in uh, Texas Austin, he talks about denialism of, of climate change. He says there are two kinds of denial. One is the Republican kind that we all know. Right? They deny the science. They kind of somehow, they don't want this to come in their way of what they think the world should be like. And so they say, oh, climate change doesn't exist, right? But there's also what he calls left-wing denialism, right? Mm -hmm. Which is the f idea that somehow everything can be done. We just have to do a small few changes, you know, change the bulbs here, you know, put on a few solar photovoltaic panels and maybe build a few nuclear power plants and the problem will go away, right? That is sort of denying the real and stupendous change that we have to make in the way we organize society if you were to really confront this problem. Right? And that's sort of not happening. There's a second way in which nuclear power sort of reinforces that, uh, which is that if you think about empirically, as I mentioned right in the beginning, you know, nuclear power plants don't emit much carbon dioxide, certainly when they, when they operate. Right? There's some stuff which happens in the way, but it's relatively small. But uh, if you look at um, a real life empirical example, um, which is the case of Japan, right? Uh, between 1970 and 1995, Japan built a huge number of nuclear power plants, right? Its nuclear capacity went from zero to approximately 40,000 megawatts. During the same period, its carbon emissions tripled from 400,000 to 1,200,000 uh, tons of, a million tons of uh, carbon dioxide. Why did that go up, right? It went up not because nuclear power plants were sort of emitting, but because 
the way nuclear power plants make any kind of economic sense is only in a society that is based on consumption of large amounts of energy. You will not invest the billions of dollars it takes to build a nuclear power plant if you're not convinced that people are going to consume all this and more, right? And if you go to France, for example, which has a huge number of nuclear power plants, their electric company goes around telling people, you should put electric heating in your house. It's extremely <laughs> inefficient way, right? But that's the way they're going to be able to sustain their thing, right? Uh, sustain their, their whole enterprise. And so this is the second reason why nuclear power is not going to really get around uh, the problem of climate change. So I will end by just saying one thing, which is that there are two ways people have approached the question of climate change. One, as I said, is that this is a climate emergency and every, every possible option should be on the table. The other way, and that's why a far fewer number of people, is to say climate change represents a, not just a threat to the, you know, the atmosphere and the environment, but to our way of thinking how our society should be organized. And we should be asking a lot of deeper questions about this. And we have to be making far more changes about it. And by sort of adopting technologies of kind of nuclear power, what you're actually doing is to sort of forget all these harder questions and not dealing with them. And I would sort of end by saying a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. <laughs> <laughs>